Good evening. I would like to welcome you to the Krasno Global Event Series. It's a great pleasure to be back after our summer break and to have a large national and tonight even global audience. I'm Klaus Lauris. I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in sunny Chapel Hill. I've been running the Krasno Event Series since 2012 when I joined UNC. The Krasno Global Event Series features leading experts from the worlds of diplomacy, the military, journalism, the media, the economy, public policy, and many other areas to talk about issues of global concern. Normally, we have live events, of course, but in view of the still continuing coronavirus crisis, this semester we are conducting our events online by Zoom. Thank you for your continued support. Let me just mention that we have a website, as you may know, krasnoevents.com and here you can find a form to fill in to be put on our global mailing list if you wish to be on our mailing list but you can also just send me an email and I will add you to the mailing list and the links uh, behind me these are the links you can uh, click to get onto the mailing list or you can simply send me an email we also have a famous and popular youtube channel youtube.com krasnounc we videotape all our events and upload them to our YouTube channel. Please do me a favor and subscribe to our channel for free. And of course, watch our event videos as often and as many as you possibly can. They're all really good. And our talk today also promises to be highly exciting. It's a great pleasure to welcome Admiral Dennis Blair tonight. Admiral Blair served for 34 years in the Navy and he is the former commander in chief of the US Pacific Command, the largest of the combatant commands. He also served on guided missile destroyers in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and he commanded the Kitty Hawk Battle Group. Admiral Blair also served as director of the Joint Staff and on the National Security Council. He held a chair in National Security Studies and he was deputy director of the Project for National Security Reform. He also was president and chief executive officer of the Institute for Defense Analysis in Alexandria, Virginia. Admiral Blair has been awarded four Defense Distinguished Service Medals and three National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medals. In 2009 and 2010, Admiral Blair served as President Obama's first director of national intelligence. This was, of course, a formidable job, probably one of the most difficult and most important jobs in the government. Admiral Blair led the 16 national intelligence agencies, administered a budget of $50 billion, and not least, he had to provide the president with integrated intelligence advice. Right now, Admiral Blair has perhaps an even more demanding job. He is a not professor of the practice here at UNC Chapel Hill. And let me tell you that all our students are very happy to have him as a teacher. His evalu evaluations have been outstanding. And Admiral Blair was an outstanding student himself. He earned a degree in history from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Admiral Blair to the Krasno Global Event Series tonight. Admiral Blair will talk about the future of the United States as a Pacific power. The Admiral will talk for something like 25 or 30 minutes. Then I will ask him a few questions and interrogate him a little. And then we would like you, the audience, to submit your many questions to the Admiral by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And when you ask a question, please be so kind to briefly introduce yourself. And if you have an affiliation, mention your affiliation as well. Our two great Krasno assistants, Brittany Broom and Pete uh, Villasmil, will select the most interesting questions and read them out aloud. Thus, please don't be shy. Please submit your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome Admiral Dennis Blair tonight to enlighten us about relations between the US and China in the Pacific and elsewhere. Over to you, Admiral. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Laris, and good, good evening, good morning, good middle of the night, uh, whatever it is for many of you who are, who are watching this uh, Zoom era that we are joining as, as really broken down all of the time zones and we don't know where, where we are in our, but we, we can get together. So as I, as I prepared the, the remarks for tonight, they grew longer and longer, but I will spare you the full text of the long form essay, which, uh, which resulted. And instead, 
I'll concentrate on the recommendations for the United States to remain a Pacific power uh, into, the, into the future. And in the question and answer period, to the extent I have not justified those recommendations, I will be glad to answer questions about them. Uh, let's see, I, I'm seeing a connection lost. Can you still hear me? Uh, I hear you fine. Okay, fine, thanks. Um, so let me, let me start by addressing the hint of a question in the title of this talk, a question about whether this country will continue to be as central and as influential in Asia Pacific fair, affairs as it has been. Uh, Michael Green, who served at the, <clears throat> in the White House on Asia affairs, has done us all a great service since he left that job by writing the long history of American involvement in Asia, a book in 27, published in 2017 called By More Than Providence. And to quote from his introduction, for over two centuries, Americans have been tied to the Pacific by commerce, faith, geography, and self-defense. Over that time, Americans have overcome bids for regional hegemony in Asia from European powers, Imperial Japan, and Soviet communism. Now, I believe strongly that the United States will continue to be a Pacific power well into the future, deeply involved, very influential in East Asia, as it has been for the last century and involved as it has been for the last two centuries. China, for its part, will continue to assert greater power, greater influence, but it will not displace the United States as the guarantor of mil military stability in East Asia, a role that the United States has filled for over half a century. Nor will it become the preferred leader of the region on important security and economic questions. Now, another book about the US-China relationship has, has received a great deal of attention. And this was Graham Allison's provocative bestseller, Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides Trap? I understand that uh, Graham Allison was a speaker here in our, our series a, a couple of years ago, and he and I have gone a couple of rounds on uh, his, his thesis, and we could talk more about it if you'd like. But what Graham says is that when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, the resulting structural stress makes a violent clash the rule, not the exception. Over the past 500 years, in 16 cases, a major rising power has threatened to displace a ruling power. In 12 of those instances, the result was war. Now I contend that there is a very low, a very low chance that the United States and China will go to war by calculation on purpose and that if there is some military incident in the East or South China Seas involving American and Chinese forces, then I believe that incident can be handled by both countries with little danger of escalation to a general conflict. However, my beliefs, my assertions are not based on some Marxian faith in the inevitability of historic forces. The United States will have to make a consistent, intelligent, strategic effort, sustained policies, sustained actions to maintain the position that it has held uh, for the last century as the greatest Pacific power. So let me start with the military actions. Uh, much has been made of China's dramatic military modernization program. Last week, the Department of Defense published its 20th report on Chinese military power. The first was issued when I was the commander in chief of the US Pacific Command. And these annual reports have chronicled a consistent story, steady growth of capability of the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, most of it directed at asserting military superiority in the East Asian region and causing damage to American forces should they intervene. Here's what the latest report states. The PRC has the largest Navy in the world with an overall battle force of approximately 350 ships and submarines, including over 130 major service combatants. In comparison, the US Navy's battle force is approximately 293 ships as of early 2020. China is the top ship producing nation in the world by tonnage and is increasing its shipbuilding capacity and capability for all naval classes. 
What matters, however, are not side-by-side -side comparisons of total numbers in the PLA Navy and in the US Navy, but whether the Chinese forces have, have the ability to carry out their mission and the mission that concerns the United States and other countries in East Asia is whether China can take and hold by military force, the Senkakus or Taiwan or the fortified features in the South China Sea against the opposition of its allies and friends supported by the United States. And right now the PLA cannot, cannot carry out that mission successfully. They can cause damage. They can, if conditions are right, put a force ashore on some of those islands temporarily, but they cannot sustain and consolidate an invasion of those features, those islands. If Japan, Taiwan, and the other claimant states in Southeast Asia and the United States make smart and sustain investments in their own military forces, this situation will not change for the foreseeable future. China would launch a military operation to take by force what it has called its core interests on its eastern and southern maritime borders only at very, very high risk. And if China attempts an invasion and fails, the domestic consequences for the Communist Party are grave, undermining, undermining the legitimacy of its rule. So what are those actions that the United States and its allies must take? Taiwan, for its part, must build a force of survivable, mobile, lethal ground, sea, and air strike platforms that can attack a Chinese invasion fleet and airborne force as it approaches Taiwan. It has the capacity to design and build these systems on its own. And under the Taiwan Relations Act, the United States is obliged to assist in order to carry out its obligation, and here I'm quoting the Taiwan Relations Act, to make available to Taiwan such defense articles and defense services in such quantity as may be necessary to enable Taiwan to maintain a sufficient self-defense capability. Japan, for its part, must continue to fortify its Southwest Islands, as it calls them, the Ryukus, as they're known on most charts, with ground, sea, and air-based forces to make it a barrier that Chinese planes, ships, and submarines cannot penetrate. The Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia, these are the other claimant states in the South China Sea, along with China, need to acquire submarines, missiles that can neutralize fortified islands and prevent their reinforcement by sea. And the United States, for its part, must develop medium-range ballistic missiles that were previously banned under the INF Treaty before the United States withdrew from it. These will enable the United States to hold at risk the heavily defended military infrastructure points along the Chinese coast that threatens the Senkakus, Taiwan, and the South China Sea. These are airfields, naval ports, missile bases, logistics depots. In addition, it must strengthen its capabilities in cyber warfare, in space, and pay new attention to the old area of electronic warfare. Chinese forces, as documented in those reports on China's military power, have been developed in recent years. They take full advantage of all of the capabilities in these areas of cyber, space, electronic, electronic warfare. And as we in the United States know, with those advantages come great vulnerabilities. For example, China has built an impressive arsenal of long-range ballistic missiles, and it has a program to build even faster and more effective hypersonic glide weapons. However, the effectiveness of all of these long-range weapons depends on intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems that can locate, identify, and track targets at long distances. And all of these systems are vulnerable to electronic countermeasures, cyber countermeasures, space counter countermeasures. The third area for the United States is to broaden its maritime and joint, <coughs> its maritime and air joint warfighting concepts. American maritime and air warfighting doctrines are currently, or have been in recent years, based around carrier battle groups in the Navy and wings of fighter aircraft for the Air Force. They need to evolve to more widespread and flexible operations using both land-based and sea-based capabilities operating across dispersed wide ocean and island, island areas to contest and gain sea and, and air control. The United States forces are working on these uh, capabilities and there are many possibilities for developments. 
And then finally, all of these armed forces need to strengthen their cooperation with one another in combined planning and exercising these enhanced capabilities. Now, I should add that under our, under our policies now, the United States does not exercise directly with the Taiwan Armed Forces. We do with Japan, with the Philippines, with Vietnam, and with, uh, and with uh, Malaysia. But to the extent that we can under policy, these armed, force, these armed forces should plan, exercise, and talk, talk about these contingencies together. And if we do all of these things for the foreseeable future, Chinese military leaders will not be able to achieve China's objectives by force of arms. That will put a sort of a deadlocked military stable situation in, in the background and on the basis of that situation, the economic competitive factors become more important in this rivalry between the United States and Japan. And that brings us to this area of economic competition, which I believe is truly the most important uh, area uh, in, the, uh, in the rivalry between the two countries. It is in the economic area that the overall strategic competition between the United States and its partners on the one hand and China will be lost or won. The winner will be the country that can sustain broad-based economic growth, international economic leadership in coming decades. Now, both countries are mature economies. China certainly has an, a region in the West which is, uh, which is still rural and agricultural, but uh, the great bulk of China, uh, where its economic miracle of the last 30 years is located is really comparable to a mature economy anywhere else in the, in the world. So its economy, as well as the American economy, as we know, face severe economic challenges. And the country that overcomes them first or best will, I believe, prevail in this competition. It's the economy that provides not only the resources for strong military, strong military power, but it also sets the a considerable degree of the influential power that a country has in the region and around the world. So for the United States, the most important steps that we must take are fundamental improvements in our own strength and competitive, competitiveness here at home. We need to invest in science, technical, engineering, and mathematical education, basic research and development, our national physical and digital infrastructure, the national investments that we made after the wake-up call of the Sputnik launch back in the 1950s are a good historical precedent, and the results of those were very, very positive. We need to continue to attract world-class talent to our universities and our companies, pursue investments in automation, productivity, and reduce the vulnerabilities in our global business supply chains. We must help American workers transition from today's job to tomorrow's jobs, especially workers with many years of experience in production jobs that are now becoming obsolete. We can do this. We, in the past, we have chosen simply to rely on the churn of the American market, generating and losing 250,000 jobs a month and just leaving it up to workers themselves to make the transition. But many other countries, many other democratic countries with advanced economies have found much more uh, positive ways to make these transitions and the United States needs to do the, do the same thing to take a lot of the local disadvantages out of the overall uh, positive advantages of global, globalization. We simply have been behind on that. And we need to accomplish all of this while controlling the budget deficit and the, and the national, national debt. Now these are relatively simple actions if you just spell them out as I, as I did, but they're incredibly difficult. They're difficult because of the current poisonous atmosphere and the deadlock that we have at the federal level in the American political system. And we must change that if we are to take these, uh, if we are to take these measures rather than just treading water uh, where we are. So that's within the United States. Now, internationally, in Asia, the United States should join what's now called the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. It formerly was known simply as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Japan now leads it. The United States withdrew. But Japan very foresightedly 
and very cleverly left a chair ready for the United States to occupy. The TPP really got caught up in the politics of the 2016 election, and we need to look at it closely. It actually fixes many of the faults of previous free trade agreements that involved the United States and the one hand on developing economies on the other. In fact, the principles of the TPP agreement as negotiated by the Obama ad administration were actually taken and used by the Trump administration to recraft NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, into the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement or USMCA. And this agreement did pass with uh, votes from both parties. The CFTPP provisions require almost no changes in American tariffs or commercial practices, but they require extensive changes from the more mercantilist developing countries that, ha that have joined them and others who are lined up to join them. And these changes, which are required by CFTPP with good enforcement provisions would remove the great majority of the non-tariff barriers that prevent the export of American goods. Therefore, they translate directly into jobs. These are job producing, uh, job producing, job in the United States, American job producing agreements. Now, in dealing with China, the United States needs to move beyond this blunderbuss brute force tactic of wide imposition of tariffs to a more targeted set of measures directed specifically at individual Chinese mercantilist practices, intellectual property theft, dumping, illegal subsidies. We need to undertake these measures with our friends and our partners, not just in a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with China. And we need to undertake them under mechanisms that are quick, not taking years of wrangling at international bodies like the WTO. So these are the military steps. These are the economic we, steps that we must take. What about the policy area? In the policy area, we do need to make some important changes. In the Asia Pacific region, the weakest set of policies we have concern the South China Sea. China is making progress there using so-called gray zone tactics, which are increases in uh, Chinese influence and actions below the level of military aggression. And in part, these tactics are successful because China faces a set of much weaker powers who are not really united against them. And China, as any big country dealing with a series of small countries would, deals with them individually, and of course, has a great deal more, <clears throat> great deal more power than each of them individually. However, in part, China's success is because of the fuzziness in American policies. It is past time to abandon this mantra the United States has used for many years. We take no position on conflicting territorial claims in the South China Sea. This policy leaves the field, leaves the ocean, the sea wide open for China to assert its preposterous claims and to tell the United States to stay out since we take no position on territorial uh, claims. We need to clarify our position on these conflicting claims to make it clear which ones we recognize, which ones we do not. China has some legitimate claims, but its extravagant claims are certainly not. We need to encourage the other claimants, the other maritime claimants, the other five, to negotiate a fair adjudication of conflicting claims in the South China Sea on the basis of the 2016 Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling. That ruling did not specifically say whose claims was right in the South China Sea, but it provided uh, a legal basis based on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for making that, taking that next step. We need to encourage the other conflicting claim countries to take it, and then the United States needs to declare that we will support this agreement that they, that they reach in accordance with our treaty obligations and our interests, which are different for different countries and for different parts of the South China Sea. So that's the one policy, one policy change that we need to certainly tighten in, the, uh, in East Asia. But beyond that, and more importantly, really, the United States needs to work more consistently and constantly with our allies, partners, and friends in the Indo-Pacific region on coordinated policies dealing with China across all of these areas uh, that we, we've talked about. 
in addition to those that I, I mentioned in which we work together on specific Chinese, uh, Chinese policies, we need to resume the leadership that we had in the region on, on, air, on issues that are of concern to everyone, such as global, global climate change, such as uh, participating in the ASEAN Regional Forum, which is the, which is the largest gathering of, uh, of countries out there and other regional forums, and on financial and economic issues, which are of great importance to the, uh, to the region on beyond uh, rejoining the CFTPP. Now, we should not require the other countries that we work with to choose between the United States and China, but we should work to form coalitions of like-minded countries to punish specific aggressive Chinese policies and actions that violate international norms. Extravagant intellectual property theft by China hurts Japan, hurts the Republic of Korea, as well as the United States. Extravagant maritime claims harm the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, as well as other seafaring nations, including the United States. Chinese subsidized projects to take to absorb the capacity of overbuilt industries hurt many countries that are trying to develop their domestic in industries by driving those companies out of business. Chinese hijacking of human rights under the competing concept of development rights hurts the freedom and democracy that is the aspiration of most people throughout, throughout the world. So the United States has a very powerful uh, position that a very powerful role that we have played in the past that we can play in the sorts of issues that come up in the, in the future. And the other countries of the region are really asking the United States to play that role and we should. Now before closing my remarks and turning to questions and discussions, I need to address one key issue. As you can tell from the recommendations and the way I've approached this topic, I call for an active involved strategic approach to the Asia Pacific region. And if the Trump administration has taught us something useful, it has been that we who have been involved in national security, Asian national security affairs for many decades, cannot take for granted that all of our fellow, all our fellow citizens share this vision of the world. For decades, the United States has played this major role in all important regions of the world, Asia especially, helping to deter military aggression, suppressing terror organizations, supporting trade and investment across international borders, keeping the sea lanes secure for the shipment of oil and other, and other commodities, and favoring the political development towards democracy. Candidate Trump and then President Trump challenged virtually all of these objectives as a candidate. And once in office, he has continued to follow very different policies and actions. And his, his approach more narrowly self-centered on a narrow definition of the interests of the United States has some support within the, within the country. Now, Michael Green wrote in that book that I cited from which I quoted earlier, that the constant American objective in Asia has been to prevent any other country, either inside the region or outside the region, that is hostile to the United States from dominating the region. Is that an objective that is worth the effort required against a rising China? Should the American people support it? Will they? Those are important questions. Let's start again with history. The United States successfully prevented Japan from establishing a greater Asian co-prosperity sphere, prevented the Soviet Union, sometimes with Chinese cooperation, sometimes not, from dominating the Eurasian continent during the Cold War. And most of us agree that these long-term grueling, sometimes bloody competitions that involved armed conflicts were worth it for the United States, that they shaped a region which has been very much in the America, to the American advantage and which has uh, been to our benefit as a, as a country, as well as a benefit to the countries in the, in the region. And I think most of us agree that the alternative of opting out of these competitions, accommodating aggression, would have resulted in much worse consequences for that region and for the United States. I would argue that the stakes in China today, if anything, are higher than they were in the 1930s, the 1980s. Asia today, generates most of the world's economic activity. It contains the world's largest armed forces, the most nuclear powers, 
It is the location of the most unresolved territorial disputes, potential conflict flashpoints. And the United States ignores or withdraws from this region at great peril to its future security and its future prosperity. And in addition, our influence and capability to influence in Asia, influence events in Asia are high. And with sensible and consistent actions like the ones that I've talked about, we can ensure that China does not come to dominate it to the disadvantage of the United States, friends, allies, and like-minded countries in the region. The United States neither should, should nor really can it attempt to contain, much less roll back, continued Chinese development and influence. These will grow as China develops economically and, and politically. However, the way in which they grow, the effect that increased uh, Chinese power and influence have within the region is very much within the American capability to direct and to limit. The United States can continue its centuries old strategy of denying domination of the Asia Pacific by an, another power. And whether this results in uh, sharing of power or a deadlock or changes on one side or the other will be determined by, by history. But the United States has it within its power to ensure that actions don't take a turn to our disadvantage. Working with our friends and allies, we can check Chinese maritime territorial aggression. We can set economic relations with China so that there is both mutual benefit and reciprocity. And we can maintain an open political order in Asia that will continue to favor a widening of response of democratic governance and an increase in human freedom. I think that's a worthy goal well within the capability of the United States, its allies, friends, and like-minded countries in the region. So let me stop there, and I look forward to uh, comments and, and discussion. Thank you very much indeed. These were very interesting insights. Thanks for enlightening us. You said at the beginning that you don't expect any conflict uh, occurring uh, by intent anytime soon. But what about conflicts by, by accident, by someone overreacting? Do you some, uh, expect something like that? I do not. Um, I was the commander in chief of the Pacific Command in 2001 uh, during the, uh, what's known as the EP3 incident. That's when an American reconnaissance aircraft was flying about 70 miles off of the island of Hainan in Southern China. A, ch a Chinese fighter ran into it, the fighter, Chinese fighter went down in the ocean with the death of the pilot. The American, uh, the American uh, reconnaissance aircraft with 24 officers and sailors on board landed in China itself. Um, it took 11 days, but both countries negotiated a mutually satisfactory end to that uh, crisis. Incidents mm -hmm. that happen at sea and on and on uh, in the air, oversea areas are, can be much more, much better controlled by governments than incidents involving military forces along borders on land where there are the involvement of, uh, of citizens of both countries. There are, there are videos and citizens are present. The, the nationalistic juices uh, spin up quite, quite quickly. In maritime and air areas, it's really, uh, the, the governments on both sides can control the information. They can take more, uh, more reasoned policies based on a careful analysis of the situation rather than being swept along by the uh, nationalistic uh, uh, strong sentiments that generally form out of a military incident. So I, I think the incidents in the areas where the United States and Chinese forces are in contact with each other uh, would, be, um, would be contained. And as I said, uh, as long as the military balance uh, continues to be maintained by the United States and, and other countries, as the Chinese analyze what would happen should they undertake military aggression deliberately in order to uh, bring Taiwan back into China, to take over the Senkakus, to increase their, uh, their uh, occupations in the South China Sea, they will see that these will not be successful and having seen that they won't be successful over time, they won't start them in the beginning. So it's really that analysis that leads me to uh, think that um, the chances of war between the United States and China are low. 
But, thank you. But apparently, uh, Xi Jinping has the ambition to bring or to reunite uh, China and to bring back Taiwan into uh, China proper. Do you expect that is going to happen soon, particularly in view of a increasing independence striving in Taiwan? And would the Chinese be able to do that? Or w and would the United States came to come to the help of Taiwan in such a scenario? Well, I mean, that that ambition has been held by every Chinese leader since Mao Zedong, and uh, and uh, but uh, they haven't had the capability to do it. And as I said in my remarks, they still don't by military military force. Uh, and and they're and the Chinese are are pursuing a not not just a military uh, capability to to bring Taiwan back into China, but they've had a very active, of course, uh, economic uh, program. Uh, making Taiwanese businesses dependent on the Chinese market on the, and the Chinese investment. They have a strong uh, propaganda campaign. They have offered uh, what look on their surface to be very attractive, um, attractive uh, conditions for Taiwan should it decide to, to join. The, everything except foreign policy and, it, and, its, uh, and military policy, uh, the Chinese government says Taiwan can uh, can decide on, on its own. Unfortunately, uh, for unfortunately for China, uh, probably fortunately for Taiwan, uh, the Chinese recent actions in Hong Kong have, uh, I think, reinforced the idea of most Taiwanese that they want to have nothing to do with uh, uh, ceding their sovereignty to uh, mainland China. It would any any agreement that China wait made would just be temporary, would probably not be honored. And once uh, China gained power, it would, uh, it would consolidate Taiwan into the, into the mainland. So the, so the, uh, China's actually taken steps backwards in its uh, attractiveness to the people of Taiwan. It's on the question of whether the United States would come to the aid of, uh, aid of Taiwan, it primarily depends on how that context that uh, military invasion would start. If Taiwan were to take a provocative action, the kind that they took back in the uh, 19, 1990s with some of their rhetoric and some, some of their actions and really provoked a Chinese attack, then I think the United States would hesitate and might even say, you know, you brought that one on yourself. Uh, uh, on the other hand, a, an, an unprovoked uh, Chinese attack. I'm positive that the United States would would resist. The United States position in the entire Asia Pacific region depends on a series of alliances in which we have undertaken under certain cir circumstances to to defend uh, uh, countries that can defend themselves. This goes for the Republic of Korea. It goes for Japan. It goes for Taiwan under certain circumstances. It goes goes for other countries. And were the United States to say, "Oh, just kidding about our." security guarantee to, uh, to Taiwan, our position would completely unravel in the region. And in, in addition, uh, Americans don't like bullies. And if a big bully China just rolled into tai Taiwan and we had the power to stop it, which we do, we would. Thank you. Going back to the South China Sea and playing devil's advocate here, if you were a policymaker in Beijing and you saw American freedom of operation, uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, would you or would anyone from uh, the Chinese Politburo not naturally object to that? So what would be the American argument to say, yes, of course, the South China Sea is in your backyard, but we still have the right to be a Pacific power as well? Well, you know, it's ridiculous. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which China and many other countries have accepted, which the United States has signed, but unfortunately not ratified, lays out quite clearly that if you look on this chart behind me, everything in blue and more can be used by all seafaring, all seafaring countries, commercial traffic, military traffic, they can all go there. And the United States has been in the South China Sea for years, I mean, back in the Vietnam War, we operated five aircraft carriers in the in the South China Sea. We have treaty allies, the Philippines, uh, on uh, on uh, one shore shore of the South China Sea. This is international waters. The Chinese have, frankly, what's a, a landsman 
or soldiers approach to these things. They don't recognize the blue on the chart. They, they, they think about C the way, the way most uh, landsmen think about C, which is that uh, distance is what matters. And if American ships come close to uh, China, whether they're in international waters or not, this is somehow uh, dangerous and, and uh, illegal. It's not. The, the convention that China itself has, has signed uh, lays out what military activities are allowed in what places. And the idea that simply because a certain body of international water is close to China, China has some uh, more authority over it than, uh, than other parts of international uh, waters is, is silly. Nonetheless, uh, Ch China is, is governed not only by a landsman attitude towards these things, but also uh, by a uh, by a might makes right approach to it. And China simply says, uh, because I am a big country and this water is close to me, I will dictate what can happen here or not. And the United States simply cannot tolerate that as a uh, seafaring nation. And how do you constructively uh, arrive at some sort of modus vivendi? Is this negotiations? Is that simple military support and political and economic support for America's allies in the region, like Vietnam and Philippines and so on? Or what is the way forward? Well, the way forward is to, uh, is to assert your rights and then back them up with your, your actions. And uh, I think that's what uh, more recently the United States has been doing uh, pretty effectively uh, with the much expanded military exercises that we conduct in that part of the world with our relations with the with the other uh, with the other countries there with their uh, activities and um, China will China will go as far on it asserting illegal rights as it's allowed to do and if it if it is resisted uh, both by policy and by military by military actions and it will uh, it will hold off and look for other ways to to go so I I, I think this is not a situation that we can we see an end to in a, in a year or two. It's it's a, a case of constantly patrolling these seas, uh, constantly asserting uh, our our rights uh, to do so, and as I say, making it clear that uh, that uh, this um, sort of uh, political competition based on military man maneuvers uh, should not break into actual military uh, fighting that's in the interest of neither side but if it were to were to happen it would be more to the disadvantage of china than it would be to uh, the united states and its friends and allies and and we just uh we just keep uh, keep asserting what our, our rights are and uh and and uh, and uh keeping the military balance thank you can you say something about the role of india in that rivalry between china and the united states which is escalating as as we uh, heard and know uh, and the notion of the indo pacific which has only recently been played up and wasn't really that much in common usage before let's say a couple of years ago is that a sensible uh, idea to talk about the indo pacific and what is india's role in all that yes the the Inclu including the Indian Ocean and the, the countries of South Asia, India, Bang Bangladesh, and, and and so on is is a is a good way of thinking about this uh, this region that we've been talking about th th this evening. Uh, India, for its part, uh, of course, has this tradition of uh, of being a very independent uh, independent country that looks in very in very uh, Metternichian, uh, Bismarckian terms, at power within the the region, and will throw its support and throw its opposition uh, to those players that it it figures can keep its uh, keep its independence and keep its uh, and keep its uh, uh, options uh, open. And right now, India feels much more threatened by China than it did by the United States back in the years of the Cold War. And so it's leaning towards, it's leaning towards cooperating with the United States uh, uh, in order to uh, offset, uh, offset uh, China's uh, influence. It, it's not just a military, it's not just a military situation from India's, India's point of view. Uh, 
we've seen these recent actions that India, India has taken to, to uh, limit Chinese economic, uh, economic inroads into India, not only in the IT sector, but also even in, uh, even in, in other products. There's, there was actually an armed, there was a clash uh, on the Indo-Chinese border in the, in the disputed uh, areas. So in, India is feeling very much that its position is being challenged by China. The more it's challenged by China, the more it will lean, lean to uh, those who would assist it in, um, in, in, in dealing with that. So I think India will play a role, but, uh, but I don't think the United States has the, despite many different romances over the years, the United States does not have the same sort of uh, rela deep relationship with India that we have with our traditional allies, Japan, Australia, and others in the, in the region. It's, it's much more uh, transactional. That's changing somewhat by, with the awakening power of Indian Americans within Within this country, uh, in Indian Americans are a uh, are becoming an influential uh, minority group here. They are working to deepen ties between the two countries. So it may be that India and the United States will form that more broad-based, uh, rich uh, relationship in which they will cooperate together in, in many areas. Right now, though, uh, it's pretty much uh, India looking for help uh, to offset growing Chinese influence. Thank you. Is there a role for the European powers? Britain and France have done some moderate uh, uh, foreign op operations, but they haven't really been present. Do you see a role for them or not? Militarily, I see very, very little role uh, for them. They do send the occasional ship to Asia and so on. But I, I think the European attitudes are changing. Uh, when, I was, um, when I was a Pacific Command commander in a few years, Afterwards, there was just a com complete diversion of security thinking between Europe and the United States. I'm, I remember uh, particularly French and German friends sitting down and saying, now Ad Admiral Blair, explain to me again about Taiwan. What does, why does the United States support Taiwan? Uh, uh, Europe basically thought of uh, China as a big bazaar. You, you, you basically uh, invested in China, you, bought goods from China, it was completely eco economic. Um, with China's more recent uh, wolf diplomacy on the diplomatic side, with its very aggressive uh, mercantilist uh, approach with the Belt and Road Initiative and so on, uh, Europe has, uh, has realized that, that uh, China uh, has a different view of the world economic order from the, the view that most European countries uh, had that uh, began after World War, World War II. And, and in addition, the, um, the sorts of repressive actions internally that China has taken uh, with the Uyghurs in the West, in Xinjiang for years, uh, more recently with Hong Kong, has made Europeans realize just what a different uh, set of values for running their country China has. So I think, I think uh, it's in these, these areas, uh, economic, economic areas and, um, and really uh, uh, values areas that uh, the Euro European countries can play a strong role by cooperating with the United States who shares those same values rather than, uh, <clears throat> rather than in some military uh, way. Thank you. All the newspapers say if Joe Biden is elected American president, the China policy of the new administration won't change all that much. Would you agree with that? Or do you think there will be huge differences between a second Trump administration or a possible Biden administration? I think the, I think the fundamental um, American realization that uh, China is a country that is actively seeking to build its place in the world, and it sees that part of building that place in the world is displacing the United States, and in many areas is really shared across the across the board. Uh, for years, the primary support for uh, permissive and good relations with China was the bit American business community, but that has shifted in recent years, and the business community now joins those of us with national security backgrounds. Uh, many in the United States that are concerned about uh, values, human rights, liberty, democracy, and there's a there's a widespread American uh, there's a widespread American feeling that we must uh, uh, we must uh, compete with China, we must stand up 
for what we believe and, and limit Chinese activities. So I think the Biden administration will reflect that. Um, they, uh, the, the form in which that is done will be quite different, I think. Uh, President Trump has a, has a far more of a presidential personality-based set of policies uh, than any that I can, I can remember. Uh, I've worked with uh, Vice President Biden in a, in a former administration. He tends to choose uh, good people to give them, uh, give them uh, resp responsibilities. And I think there will be a sort of less White House-centered, more general, uh, and hopefully more consistent American, American policy heading towards these same goals of setting limits on Chinese uh, activity in areas that are injurious to our interests while uh, cooperating with them on areas uh, in, which, uh, in, in, in which we both can benefit and in which there's plenty of room for both of us. So I, don't, I think uh, the bedside manner will change. I think the basic policy will remain pretty much the same. Thank you. Before opening it up to questions, I have to ask you, you were a director of national intelligence during the Obama administration. What was it like to be in that position? What was it like to work with President Obama, Biden, and so on? The national and the intelligence community, as it's called, 16 agencies, budgets in the tens of billions, um, contrary to popular imagination, is not all based on the president's daily briefing every morning down in the, in the White House. It's a huge enterprise that provides uh, intelligence support to soldiers, diplomats, trade negotiators, uh, the full range of government, uh, full range of government ac activities, as well as uh, as well as briefing the president uh, personally. Um, so most of my time, frankly, was spent in ensuring that that intelligence community was. Uh, moving into the into the future, their tremendous technical possibilities, the uh, using new technologies and IT, artificial intelligence, so on, satellites, uh, cyber took a huge amount, amount, amount of effort and uh, dealing with the president was part of it. I would say that the uh, Obama administration was quite uh, receptive to hearing a, an intelligence uh, appraisal of a situation. Uh, intelligence when done well uh, cannot tell a policymaker what to do, but it can sort of set broad limits of the way that people we are dealing with, whether they're our friends or our enemies or approaching the uh, situation, some of the likely reactions that they would take. And that's sort of a, a give and take between the policymakers and the intelligence community is, is healthy. And I felt that uh, during the Obama ad administration, uh, those, were, uh, those were pretty healthy discussions. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, intelligence information has been, become uh, quite politicized. The, 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 the motives of intelligence officers are questioned. Uh, you told me this because you want to, uh, you want to cover, your, cover your sense of responsibility. You told me this because you're a secret Republican or a secret Democrat. That sort of, that sort of personal uh, questioning has really poisoned the uh, provision of intelligence at the very highest at the very highest levels. And many politicians now feel they can get their intelligence from other sources, sometimes their preferred sources. So I'd say the intelligence at the high levels has, has, been, um, has been made worse because of this political uh, slant that now is given to it by many people in Congress and in the administration down at the working level where a soldier wants to know where an IED is buried, where a diplomat wants to know what the talking points are of the person he's negotiating, negotiating with, where a, the FBI wants to know where a terrorist is located, that area uh, intelligence is doing very well, is valued, and is performing its proper function. Thank you. Traditionally, the CIA director was, well, let's say, the big guy in the intelligence community. And then under the Bush administration, a director of national intelligence was in, uh, invented, who is still in existence. But the current holder of the office is highly controversial. And I was wondering, was that sort of controversy, interagency controversy, not also prevalent during the Obama administration? Yeah, the... the Intelligence agencies were sometimes like happy children who 
been put in an orphanage and the director of national intelligence was, uh, was the head of the orphanage. They, uh, many of them preferred the former system where they had relatively, uh, where they are relatively free to uh, go directly to the White House, directly to, uh, the, to policymakers and they, they valued that freedom and they, to a certain extent, they resented the director of national intelligence forced them to play together nicely. Uh, and, um, and, and in fact, the, uh, the idea of a national intelligence enterprise is still a, is still a work in progress because uh, the um, many others, generally those who don't know much about intelligence, uh, uh, think that, well, a DNI is not adding any, any value. It's just one more layer of bureaucracy. We were fine the way we were. My experience is that was, that was not true. The individual intelligence agencies will be less than the sum of their parts if they just operate in an uncoordinated, uh, decentralized uh, fashion. If you do uh, put someone in charge, put the responsibility on him or her to provide intelligence in, of the most important questions that face, face the country and uh, give that person the authority to, uh, to uh, hold them to account, then we will have better, better intelligence. So I'm, I'm still a a uh, proponent of a strong director of national intelligence, but um, uh, th there are those uh, who have other views. Uh, they have many su supporters uh, within these uh, intelligence agencies themselves who were much felt that they can do things on their own if they just are supported by the other agencies. So it, it really hasn't been worked out yet. Okay, thank you very much. There are many other questions I could ask you, but let's open it to our uh, questions to our audience. And perhaps I can ask Brittany to ask the first question from the audience. Hi, Brittany. Hi, of course. So the first question is from retired Foreign Service Officer Ambassador David C. Litt with the Institute for Defense and Business in Chapel Hill. He asked, what do you believe the political, economic, security, and security impacts of climate change on the Indo-Pacific Indo region and will be in the next 20 to 25 years? It's, in my experience, the, when nature throws tragedy at one country or, or several countries, the usual reaction of other countries is to rally around and try to help. And I believe that as climate change climate change is manifested in more extreme and more violent weather patterns, uh, it will, they will be, they will show up in the places that we have weather tragedies right now, the low lying areas of Bangladesh, the areas of the Philippines that typhoons devastate with uh, a great deal of regularity. I think these will grow and and become more widespread. And I think that the result will be that uh, the countries of the region will probably cooperate better to try to, to try to handle them. I think that each individual country, of course, will have the responsibility for uh, doing what it can for its own, own citizens. But I, I don't, um, and I've had discussions with people who've thought deeply about it, I, I don't see uh, international conflict coming out of uh, coming out of climate change. I don't see a massive refugee uh, flows, which may be one of the effects uh, causing a major war between uh, countries in Asia. If you look at the refugee flows now, whether it be the Rohingyas coming out of uh, coming out of Myanmar and going up into uh, Bangladesh, the Bangladesh, Bangladeshis in the western part of that country moving towards, uh, moving towards India, uh, uh, boat people uh, coming across South e Southeast Asia. These generally, these generally are handled by cooperative relations, cooperative measures between the uh, countries concerned with varying degrees of humanity and border Crossing, so I, I just I see the climate change uh, playing out in Asia as being more chaotic, 
but not leading to major conflict, rather leading to uh, probably inconsistent and case-by-case -case, uh, cooperation to try to mitigate the tragedies that it will cause. Thank you. Pete, would you like to ask the next question? Absolutely, Dr. Lars. We have a question from uh, Captain Andrew Hertel, who's a department chair and head of the NROTC program at UNC Duke and NC State Universities. Um, he asked, basic deterrence theory talks about having both strength and capability and then the will to use that strength and capability. What are some tangible actions you can think the U.S. can take to demonstrate our resolve against China's inappropriate conduct in any number of areas? We have lots of capability, but it does not appear we have lots of resolve to use it. Dual CBN ops in the South China Sea is good for a photo op, but does it really change anything in the region? Well, the the history of uh, Asian countries who have believed that the United States would not take action is a uh, pretty bad history for those who made that, uh, made that as assumption. Um, and anybody who sort of looks at history of how democracies end up going to war realizes that uh, the lack of a a lack of a response at, at one level, and maybe even repeated times, uh, does not simply signal that uh, the country will not take any response, but a sort of a pressure builds up until an incident that may not be as serious as some earlier incident really trips the balance, and the country decides, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons, that this is it fights on. Uh, if you, the, the whole history of the slow buildup of American involvement in, in World War II is, is, uh, is one case. Uh, and yet on the other side, we have a situation like uh, Korea in 1950, when the president went to war within 22 hours uh, without even asking permission of Congress in response to, in response to aggression. So I, I think the, um, I think you simply cannot construct some sort of schematic uh, approach that says uh, if uh, an enemy of the United States does this, then the United States will react in this way and it will take exactly this much provocation before the United States will act. It's, it, the, uh, the uh, domestic politics within a country, the degree of uh, degree of uh, personal experience and uh, and of, of the lead, of the president and his or her close advisors is what really uh, determines these things and as I say it's a rash country that uh, that, that thinks that it, it can uh, it can count on the United States uh, not not responding so that being said as I said in my remarks I think the basic thing the the important thing that you can do is keep up your capability so that uh, so that when your potential enemies uh, go back in their war colleges and in their analyses and try to play through what would happen should uh, should uh, a conflict start, uh, it turns out to be for them very high risk, or the results are or the results are negative. So that's really the main job we have as um, we have as professional uh, national security uh, for military officers and com commanders and and so on. And I think that if we do that. Uh, then the um, then uh, China or wh whatever whatever other countries try to uh, try to take our measure uh, will uh, be be deterred, especially when they have other alternatives. I mean, I think the challenge for American diplomacy and policy is not to back China in a corner. As I, as I said in my remarks, I don't the kind of measures and the kind of policies that I advocate are not telling China. You can't do anything. This is not cutting off Japanese rubber and oil imports from Southeast Asia. This is not stopping the shipment of American scrap iron to Japan, uh, throttling their, their defense in industry. This is setting uh, international economic rules that others have followed and been able to obtain a prosperity. China itself, of course, uh, obtained tremendous prosperity under, under these same rules. 
Uh, and, but it, it is simply saying that uh, you cannot use military aggression to achieve these goals that you have. If you can convince the Taiwanese people of Taiwan that they would like to join you because China is a very attractive place and, uh, uh, and they can live as well or better as part of China that they can well now as part of Taiwan, go ahead. Uh, uh, and we, we uh, simply have to lay it out to, to China in that, in that, in that form. So I, I, I think concentrate on, concentrate on the capabilities and the policies, uh, leave, the, uh, leave the business of demonstrating will to, uh, uh, to others. Thank you. So decoupling the American and Chinese economy is not a good idea when I listen to you. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea to couple if it's done under reciprocal mutually advantageous rules. The, uh, the Chinese early idea of decoupling was to go into joint ventures with an American company, uh, learn how to, learn how to, uh, do the business of that particular industry or a company, then regulate the Chinese market so that a Chinese copycat company would have an advantage, build up that Chinese copycat uh, company until it, uh, until it uh, attained international world-class skills and then have it go compete internationally with that international company, whether it be American or Japanese or Western European, uh, subsidized by the Chinese government under their go abroad policy. I mean, that is not coupling. That is a development, developing country strategy in order to uh, gain, a, uh, gain an advantage in international national rules. I think we should punish all of the individual elements of that behavior now that China is a, is a developed uh, country and their, their, their companies can compete internationally. Uh, they can invest in the United United States, we should invest there and so on. There can be joint ventures between them, but on the rules that have grown up in the rest of the world since the, uh, uh, since the uh, end, of, end of World War II. If China uh, enters into those rules and, and, uh, and follows them, then they're, they're most welcome. And there are, there are many, many capable Chinese companies who, who, would, uh, who would benefit from, from that. Uh, and there would be the sort of mutual win-win deals that we uh, associate in the past, but we can't do it when China is pursuing the principles of, of their declaration called Made in China 2025, which is a all government effort to dominate the 10 key industries of the, of the world using all of the uh, power that China has in its, uh, in, in its place. As long as China uh, keeps that ultra nationalist mercantilist approach to economists, then, uh, then uh, cooperating together will be very difficult. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Brittany, do we have another question? We do. The next question is from Samuel Quesada, who is a Peace, War, and Defense major at UNC and is currently in Admiral Blair's 9-11 seminar class. Samuel asks, if the, U if the inconsistent U.S. foreign policy continues, Will we see a more, Asia, more Asian countries reluctantly side with China, or will we see a rise of, say, India or a new CETO-like treaty to counter them? And what are the implications of either scenario? The, um, the countries of Asia, and I, I've talked with many leaders of them over the years and, and have friends all uh, thought that the era of American power from say 1975 when uh, we left Vietnam up until the present were a pretty good time for them. Uh, if you're going to have a country that's the most powerful in your region, it's good to have one whose homeland is a long way away, who does not have territorial ambitions, uh, for example, in uh, the 1980s, uh, the Philippines decided that it didn't want to have U.S. bases uh, in the Philippines, so we left. Uh, and, and the United States was thought of as this uh, generally well-meaning uh, um, country that uh, was, had the military capability to stop aggression, at least aggression across water and air from, from happening. And that kept the 
intra-regional military rivalries under control, and they turned to economic and then ultimately political development. And it was truly a, a golden era for Asia, including for China, which we have to remember pulled 300 million of its citizens out of poverty through its own economic, uh, economic development. And it basically used the same formula that had been used before by Japan, by Republic of Korea, by Taiwan, by Singapore, uh, which is to connect with the international economy, sell into the U.S. market of, uh, of goods that you manufacture in your, in your country, accept foreign investment, both in terms of money and in terms of skills. And, and, this, uh, and this was a tremendously, um, a, a tremendously uh, effective formula, and East Asia did, did really well. So there's a predisposition, I think, to uh, favor American leadership over, over the type of Chinese leadership that we have uh, seen China exhibited, particularly in the last 10 years or so, since uh, uh, just before Xi Jinping and certainly, certainly uh, since Xi Jinping came into, uh, came into power. Uh, now, if you want to look at an indication of a um, sort of a third way, a sort of a countries in Asia having to fend for themselves, I think, the coronavirus response has been a has been a good example. Uh, basically, the countries of Asia have been thrown on their own resources to deal with the coronavirus, and they have done it uh, with various degrees of skill and effectiveness. Uh, uh, those who went through the SARS uh, epidemics back in the uh, back in twenty o but 2004, 2005, were well prepared, handle it, pretty well, handle it pretty well. They didn't look for help from China. They didn't look for help from the United States. They really relied on their own, uh, their own capability. I think both the United States and China came, uh, but the, rep, the leadership reputations of both China and the United States came out badly from this, are coming out badly from this coronavirus epidemic. China, because for all of the reasons, uh, uh, that uh, most people don't want to live in China, uh, immediately covered up, uh, prosecuted those who tried to tell, tell the truth, clamped down on, uh, on citizens with draconian, uh, draconian measures, and then denied it uh, all to the world. And we, and we all know that the American response has, has been no thing of beauty uh, either, as we have not really worked together as a country to prioritize resources on this, but have, have left a very decentralized approach, which in many cases has involved competition at the lower levels and our, and our the numbers in terms of those who have sickened and those who have died are very, very high. So there is this uh, third way, I think, in which, uh, in which Asia uh, says that we have to really rely on our own, our own um, uh, resources to handle these things, reaching out to countries that we agree, agree with. So I think what we'll see it, in the future will really depend on what happens in the United States, what happens in, uh, in China, and what happens in the rest of the world. If China, if China continues its sort of bullying uh, military behavior, then it will, it will sort of draw the net tighter around its, own, uh, around its own ambitions. And although I think it's unlikely that there would be another Southeast Asia Treaty or Organization, the greater military cooperation and contact we see among other countries outside of China uh, uh, will, will continue and China will be faced by a coalition brought about by its own, own actions. If China plays its hand smartly the way it did up until about 20, 2010 or so, then many countries will want to certainly cooperate with China econ economically, maybe in, other, maybe in other areas, and it can build its, uh, can build its influence uh, that way. So. Uh, those are really sort of the, the three possible futures. And as I say, I think the main, the main uh, determinant of whether this happens is what, what the United States does uh, in the future. Thank you. I just noticed a question from Beijing, from Shitao Shu. He asked whether the, campaign, whether the uh, US-China relationship will further be a campaign issue and whether it will actually be decisive for who is going to win the uh, presidential election. As everybody knows, uh, 
in, in the history of uh, American presidential elections, when China has been an issue, it's generally been had bad effects on the U.S.-China relation. Subsequently, uh, the presidential candidates uh, generally compete to see who can be quote toughest on on China, and they have found once they take once they take office that it's a complicated relationship that uh, just being tough doesn't uh, doesn't solve much. Uh, certainly this administration has, has found that, the former administration has found that, uh, it, it happens uh, frequently. So my personal hope certainly is that China not be a, not be a big campaign issue between the Republicans and the Democrats fought over the issue of who can be, who can be, who can be tougher. Um, I don't think it will be. I, I think that the main issues in the American presidential election that I see are, are domestic. They have to do with the way we've handled the coronavirus, with the, what people think about the economic future of the country uh, domestically, uh, this, the contrasting visions that the, the two parties uh, present for the future of the United States. So I think it's fought on more fundamental issues than than foreign policy, whether it be China or something else. So, as I said earlier in, in, in my remarks, I think that um, I think that uh, we will not see a uh, things done by the presidential candidates that they will then have to regret or walk back or or try to implement on China once uh, once elected on either side. I think they will uh, be able to take a sort of a fresh start at Chinese policy, hopefully learning from what was done in the past, uh, getting good ideas from the future. And we can have this sort of uh, relationship in which we set limits for China, but certainly keep, out, keep up areas where uh, uh, there are either mutually beneficial issues or in which uh, we can compete without worrying that, worrying that we're fundamentally encroaching on the, on the sovereignty or, or uh, future of the other country. Thank you. Let me also quickly ask that question from a person from Oliver Stelling from, uh, from Dubai, who is joining us. He asks if there is that, uh, if Xi Jinping has that kind of historical mission to make uh, China a really globally important or the most important power there is, and uh, will relations further escalate? And does the United States prepare for such a possibility, even if it is a remote possibility? I think that, uh, that that sort of a relationship would play out, uh, would play out over time. Uh, it's, it, it's ironic, isn't it, that um, one of the lessons of, uh, of the really tumultuous period of recent Asian histories from, say, the early 1930s when Japan went into, went into Manchuria all the way through the end of the Vietnam or end of Americans' involvement in the Vietnam War in 19, 1975 uh, has been that uh, although the wars settled some things, they did not bring the kind of prosperity that a period of peace, which began in 1975 and has gone through the present, has brought to the country. Now, of course, every every country likes to thump its chest and say that it's uh, it's powerful militarily and it'll support its interests and all. But if you want a formula for prosperity in Asia, if you want a formula that will make the lives of your people better, it's based on a peaceful world with lots of trade, lots of personnel interchange. Uh, China was um, embarked on this. Uh, embarked on this path for, for many years. Of course, they had their territorial ambitions. They had, their, they had the things that they, they wanted. So did, so did other, other countries. But the payoff for the Chinese was generally based on their economic prowess, not on their uh, military, uh, anything that they did uh, mil militarily. So one would hope, and, then, and when I was the commander back in 2000, as I said, uh, that was a time that uh, China, I, I would go to Beijing and I would talk to PLA generals and they would tell me how they were going to build up and 
and uh, displaced the United States. Uh, and, and it was sort of a, a typical nationalist uh, reaction. The civilian leadership that I talked to in uh, talked to in China would generally uh, have a wider view that uh, China's future was more had to do with economic and political development than it had to do with military uh, military uh, cap capability. So we will see just how far just how far China goes with this uh, with this military buildup and with the illusion that it can uh, satisfy some of its um, ambitions by military conquest. Uh, the, the history of that has not been has not been good in Asia and elsewhere. The countries that have really gotten ahead have been the countries that have done so under conditions of peace, both in Asia and in elsewhere. As far as the United States preparing for for uh, that kind of a future. I would go back to the prescription that I that I gave in my remarks, which is that uh, the real challenge for the United States is to deal with the economic problems that we face. We need to improve the education system. We need to improve our physical and digital infrastructure. We need to fix the dysfunction in our national level politics. If we can do that, then I have no doubt that the United States will be both capable and very ready to handle whatever happens in uh, in the in what China may uh, may happen, so I, I would say that would be the best way that we can prepare. Okay, thank you, Pete. Do you have some more questions? Yeah, so I have a question from a student uh, who is a freshman peace, war, and defense major at UNC. His name is Sid Reddy, and he's curious about the Belt and Road Initiative. How much of a threat is China's Belt and Road Initiative to the United States economy and military influence in Asia? Other than rejoining the TPP, are there any other concrete policies you believe that can be used to counter the Belt and Road Initiative? I think there are some good features of the of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. The the need of um, Southern and Central Asia for infrastructure investment is just huge. It runs into the 20 or 30 trillion dollars in order to upgrade the upgrade the electrical distribution systems, especially in a way that doesn't uh, that doesn't contribute to global warming in terms of transportation infrastructure to give citizens access to where the jobs are in their in their countries to build uh, supply chains that will allow uh, citizens of countries to participate in the in in the global uh, increase in in prosperity. So there there are plenty of good things about uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. The the bad things uh, are also not not new. Uh, if you simply saddle a uh, saddle a developing country with a, a lot of debt, uh, you're not really helping it. Uh, it it needs to have a a decent currency as well as as well as uh, investment. Um, I think we should keep an eye on the, the dual use uh, port facilities, naval bases, which uh, we see at places like the, like uh, Gwadar, uh, Pakistan, uh, potentially in, in uh, Cam uh, potentially either in Cambodia or even in, uh, in, in Myanmar. These, these would find these would make it easier for uh, China to extend its uh, power projection capability in new areas of the, of the world. Uh, but the uh, the medium size and large powers that are in the region can can offset the at, offset those if they if if they must. Um, I have uh, during the Cold War, the United States and um, and uh, the Soviet Union uh, often would have these competitive uh, investment or aid schemes in which the who could build the tallest dam in in Egypt or who could uh, build the uh, who could build the uh, the best uh, government building uh, downtown was um, was the way these things were measured. And uh, what I found was that uh, countries, <clears throat> developing countries, were very happy to accept the aid, uh, but it didn't affect their uh, unwillingness to uh, allow these countries that gave them the aid to dictate their their real important national security concerns and that. If it actually things came to a certain point that they felt that an outside country was too 
too much interfering in them, they tell them to leave. And, uh, and then they generally could make that, make that happen. So uh, I think that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is not really a threat and we shouldn't think of it that way. I do think that, um, that we should offer alternatives to these uh, countries uh, which are looking for infrastructure <clears throat> investment, but we should, in those, in those offers, we should use all the things we've taught about foreign assistance uh, and projects like that over the years. We should, we should uh, make sure that any project that you do in a developing country leaves skills and, and local capacity behind, not just a shiny building that you build with imported, imported workers and then, and then leave, as I, as I often have seen in Myanmar and other, other, other places. We should ensure that the, uh, the rate of return of any investments that are made will eventually uh, pay back anything that is in the form of a, form of a loan. We should, hold these, uh, we should hold these projects to high environmental and labor and labor standards. So the organizations like the World Bank uh, have, have a, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Japanese uh, uh, JICA, their international aid agency, have learned uh, mainly through hard experience of doing the wrong thing, the right way to develop infrastructure in uh, developing countries. And to the extent that China follows those uh, follow those rules good for them and they should help it. And the United States and Japan and, and the other developed countries, including those in Western Europe should continue uh, to make these, uh, to, to try to feed this need for uh, development, but do it in a responsible way based on what we've learned over the decades of doing it. Okay, thank you, Brittany. Any more questions? Of course, so our next question is from Kevin Hoper, who is a PhD history student here at UNC. He says, my question comes from some reading I've been doing on British naval strategy in the years before World War I. Back then, the Royal Navy and Expeditionary Force had competing visions of British involvement in a, in a future European war. So I'd like to know if the US service branches today are in broad agreement about the shape of potential US military strategy in East Asia, or are there different strategic visions being put forward by the Army, Air Force, and Navy? When the United States uh passed probably the best piece of legislation affecting the Department of Defense in my lifetime, the Goldwater-Nichols Act of, uh, of 1986. It really set up a structure in which an operational commander, in the, in the case of the Pacific, the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Command was the one who really had the responsibility for the plans and the operational forces and, and uh, any conflict should it take place. And the services had the job of organizing, training, and equip and equipping forces uh, that would then be used in, in, that, uh, in that plan. And <clears throat> there was certainly a, a back and forth between the operational commander on the one hand and the, and the service chiefs on the other hand. The service chiefs tended to have a longer range vision. They were more and more responsibility for, de for developing new technologies, for making new uh, programs. The, uh, the combatant commander generally had a shorter term vision of how do I carry out my responsibilities today, whether in North Korea, in a potential Taiwan response, in carrying out our responsibilities in Japan, Japan and so on. But it was a healthy, a healthy tension. And if one of the services came up with a really good idea uh, that would increase uh, its ability to carry out the job that the mission that the commander that the regional combatant commander was vision there was no hesitation in the in the, the regional combatant commands of taking that on board adjusting plans accordingly so uh, on the other hand um, the op the operational commanders uh, if they had a good idea they could feed it back to the services and said you know anybody who can uh, anybody who can tell me how to immobilize an entire military cyber network without immobilizing the civilian cyber network in a, in a region of the world, uh, that would be very useful. And, and that kind of dialogue of requirements and technological opportunities and the rhythms of programs is really played out on a, on a daily and certainly on an annual basis within the plan, Pentagon planning process is that I see. And, and this, uh, 
And this, I think, is done better in the American armed forces than, than frankly, it is in almost all other armed forces in the world. Small size does not necessarily mean uh, that services cooperate well together. In fact, some of their some of their uh, rivalries uh, can be can be quite fierce and uh, to the detriment of the overall warfighting capability of their country. So I I think that what we will see is with these um, different service concepts that. Uh, that we see coming from the, the Air Force, their, their joint uh, air operations uh, 21, the, the Army's uh, long range fires uh, capability, the Navy's new operational capabilities. I think these are all good ideas which uh, will be uh, worked out in combination with the combatant commander who has the, the real responsibility for employing them and the cooperation will just improve. The, um, I'd say from the time that I was combatant commander 20 years ago for the last uh, the last 20 years. I mean, I, t t speaking frankly, the United States could support Taiwan without even scratching the paint on our on our ships or aircraft when I was out there. We were just that uh, we were just that much more powerful. Uh, China's been working assiduously for 20 years to cut into that uh, cut into that capability. And what they've mostly invested in are the things that uh, I would have done had I been a Chinese uh, Chinese general or admiral. They've invested in submarines. They've invested in long range missiles. These are the things that uh, would have the most, uh, would raise the cost the most to the United States. And they've done it very skillfully. I would tell my Chinese contacts openly that uh, they've had a smart, smart plan and I can, I can understand it. The United States has not been uh, quiescent during that, that time, recognizing that what China has, has done that uh, cuts the level of deterrence, the level of confidence, uh, the American forces, all of them, have uh, been figuring out ways to uh, counter what China has done and to and to build the, the American capability. So it's this it's this crew race of one side stroking hard, pulling ahead, the other side pulling ahead that we're in, involved in the, in the middle of, and the United States with a much bigger defense budget, which much which much greater combat experience with a much more, I think, flexible system is the one that I think will come out with the right answers that will keep deterrence high. Thank you very much. There's a question from a lady from Urumqi in Xinjiang who is now, now in the United States. She's wondering whether China is uh, trying to really undermine the World Trade Organization and trying to replace it with a multilateral order uh, of its own. Do you think there's any validity to that? I think China is trying to take whatever advantage it can <clears throat> of the international financial and business system that it that it found in order to advance its own its own uh, interests. Uh, <laughs> the the United, uh, foreign companies were perfectly willing to share their. Uh, intellectual property with uh, Chinese Chinese partners and the Chinese said uh, thank you very much uh, uh, Japan I, I, I really like this design for your bullet trains and I think I will uh, build an entire uh, several Chinese companies that use the same technology and we'll give the we'll give the contracts for the tremendous expansion in the Chinese bullet train system to these Chinese uh, Chinese companies uh, and uh, if if you, Japan, bring a suit against us in the World Trade Organization, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to go through the long, tedious, years-long process. And in the end, if we have to pay a fine, we have to pay a fine. I mean, I, I think uh, China has been quite, uh, quite ruthless and, and uh, China-centered in, in taking the international economic system as it found it and, and taking advantage of everything it could for Chinese for Chinese purposes. Uh, the trouble is now it's become so big, the second largest economy in the in the world, uh, of course, in its, it, its own right, that uh, it's, it just is not going to be able to act in that in that in that fashion without uh, bringing down that system on from which it uh, from which it benefited. So we, we have to we have to move to some sort of a system in which China does not just take the benefits and uh, escape the responsibilities. Now, whether that is a sort of a hybrid system in which China has greater voting rights in uh, 
in bodies like the IMF and the World Bank and so on, whether uh, the WT is in fact, WTO is in fact uh, reformed and some of these Chinese uh, uh, policies uh, get into it uh, will we'll be seen. But uh, it's, the rest of the world is simply not going to allow a Chinese system that is set up for uh, the benefit of the Chinese domestic uh, economy at the expense of all of the other economies in the in the world. And that's what uh, China seems to be pushing for at this point. So I think there will have to be, there will have to be adjustments made. And uh, there are very smart and capable Chinese businessmen, economists who, who realize, who realize this. Uh, but as long as the, as long as the music is playing, they have to get on the dance floor and do what's in uh, China's interest and take advantage of the of what they're allowed to do by other countries and other and other companies. I think, uh, in many cases, the uh, the rest of the world has become is uh, is realizing this and uh, and needs to act, as I said in my remarks, more in concert uh, to uh, defend what is to everybody's benefit in in that system, and uh, then let China compete on the basis of this uh, of uh, reciprocity and equal equal rights. And if China's Chinese companies get ahead under those those conditions, uh, it won't mean the destruction of uh, companies in other in other countries, but the, the pie will grow and China's share in it will grow larger. And I think that that's a perfectly acceptable future. Thank you very much. I think we have a few more minutes uh, for a few more questions, if that is all right with you, Admiral. Fine. Okay, thank you. Then I would like to pass on to Pete. I think it was your turn to ask a question. Is that correct? And maybe Brittany's. Um, All right, then I'll, sorry, I'll go to Brittany then. So the next question is from Mike Bennett, who is a retired um, Foreign Service officer and Naval officer. Does the 20th report that you mentioned earlier cover any problems that China's Navy may have had or is facing in terms of the spread of the virus causing ships to be disabled? No, the report itself does not. Uh, does not talk about the effect of uh, coronavirus on the armed forces. If you judge by the um, if you judge by the deployment uh, activities of uh, the People's Liberation Army since the since March, since the COVID happened, uh, that they have been able to uh, contain contain it quite well among their among at least the ships and aircraft and soldiers that they are sending overseas and into, and into <clears throat> exercises. Uh, the United States, despite uh, the incident with the Theodore Roosevelt carrier in, in Guam, has actually been able to, to do the same. The, the level of American operations in, uh, in East Asia has been at, at historical levels and, e and even higher. So I, I think the, I think the uh, COVID is not having a, um, is not having an immediate uh, an immediate effect. Uh, the I think the, the greater challenge is that the that the PLA faces uh, are that um, the nature what technology will allow in modern warfare is a much more dis decentralized um, self self synchronizing uh, military operations and China by the nature of its society and the, by the nature of control that it wants to exert is still a very top-down centralized uh, society. And the same is true of its direction of the armed forces. It wants to have uh, units being given their orders, carrying them out, reporting back, um, uh, and, uh, and then waiting for the next order. This works okay for, uh, for set pieces uh, early on in, in conflicts when things are absolutely predictable. Most of warfare is not like that, though. Uh, most of warfare uh, is much more chaotic, and and in it, the uh, initiative and the and the actions taken at lower levels uh, is is uh, what's what's decisive. Uh, the big uh, China, in many cases, is developing uh, very sophisticated pieces of equipment. But they're not being operated to their full capability by this uh, centrally controlled system that China is um, uh, that, that China uh, follows by nature. Now there are articles in the Chinese military 
for us would say exactly the same exactly the same thing. We need to develop more initiative. We need to develop the ability to operate at night. We need the ability to operate without communications. We, we need, we need, we need. But uh, it's one thing to say it in a military journal. It's quite another if your entire uh, system is set up on, uh, on centralized, uh, centralized control. So that in the midst of, and, and, that, uh, and that deficiency is not, is not visible at all in peacetime, because in peacetime, plenty of communications, plenty of time to check back with Beijing to see what uh, you, need to, you need to do. It doesn't really come up until, uh, until uh, uh, the conflict actually, actually starts. But, but smart uh, Chinese officers know about their shortcomings in these areas. And again, if you read their press closely, uh, you will see that they recognize it and are, and are trying to find ways to do it. But they're swimming, they're swimming against the stream of the way that uh, Chinese society is set up. And that's their, that's their primary weakness, despite all of the fancy equipment, which they roll out at parades and they, and they show when they're um, on CCTV. Thank you. But now to, to Pete, I would say. Yes, uh, we have a question from a gentleman by the name of Jay Bridger. Do you envision shifting alliances in the Asia Pacific area in the near future? I really don't. Um, I don't see any country wanting to ally itself with China. There is Cambodia, of course, which is become really a vassal state of, uh, of China. Uh, although even then, uh, Hun Sen uh, has the occasional, the occasional flash of resentment against uh, China and goes off on his own, on his own line. The most important alliance in the region, the United States and Japan, has certainly been deepening in recent years. It's certainly much more dynamic, powerful, and vibrant than it was 20 years ago when I was the uh, combatant commander and Japan was halfway through its, uh, its lost uh, genera gen generation. Uh, Prime Minister Abe has really uh, brought Japan back in a big way. And I know the, uh, the three possible successors, and I think they would all continue his policy. So I think the U.S.-Japan alliance is in, is in good shape. Uh, the U.S. Republic of Korea uh, alliance uh, the, with uh, President Moon and so on, there, there's some sharp divergences over North Korean policy, which flash from time to time. But underneath that, the military and, uh, and business relationships seem pretty, pretty solid. I'd say that the, um, as far as the U.S. alliance structure goes, the, the biggest improvement that we could see would be in the Philippines. Uh, you know, uh, President Duterte is sort of, <laughs> sort of a unique, unique figure. Uh, his background, uh, in his background, there's some, there was some strong personal res resentment against, uh, against the United States. Uh, I know many Philippine officials and leaders and they definitely feel that for the long term, their their future lies with with the United States. And I would assume that when uh, President Duterte leaves leaves the scene, that I think more basic instinct will will reassert itself. Uh, Thailand is uh, who knows. Uh, Thailand is uh, going through a a tremendous uh, transition from its uh, former sort of monarch military-based uh, based situation. I would say that the, I would say the possibilities for the American friends and alliance system are greater than they are for any Chinese alliance uh, system. But I think we would see changes, uh, changes coming from a fairly long distance away, barring some major crisis in the region, which is uh, not too likely. Thank you very much, Brittany. Yeah. The next question is from Alexander Pennington, who is a Peace War and Defense major here at UNC. They ask, North Korea has been a complicated issue for years. 
We have had both Democrats and Republicans trying to get North Korea to abandon its nuclear program. Is the idea of North Korea giving up their nuclear program or even uniting with South Korea a lost cause? If not, what could be done to bring the country closer to that goal since many have tried and failed? It's absolutely true that, uh, that uh, the United States and Republic of Korea and China have tried virtually everything with North Korea. Tried working with them, tried bribing them, tried ignoring them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, North Korea is just this uh, unique, uh, absolutely dicta dictatorial, uh, hagiographic, uh, uh, self-reliant uh, country that's really remarkable and unique and unique in um, I think in recent world history, there's nothing really quite like it. Um, if you, but I think if you want to raise the larger question of uh, which part of the European or which part of the Korean peninsula is a success and which part is a failure, I think you only need to look at that famous uh, nighttime satellite photograph that uh, is often circulated about them north of the 38th parallel, pretty dark, few points of light, south of the 38th parallel in the Republic of Korea, a bursting, bright, vibrant country. So it's quite clear that uh, the part of the Korean peninsula, the part of the Korean people that have been successful <clears throat> are those who lived in the south and those million or so who moved from the north to the south when the Korean War ended. Um, meanwhile, this bizarre despot in the, in the North through a combination of propaganda and, and ruthless uh, suppression has, has held on to power, uh, starved, starved his people, uh, and, yet, and yet been able to uh, develop nuclear weapons and, and uh, do all of the things that we have, we have observed. Uh, so I, I don't think there is a a realistic way to uh, say, okay, our objective is to get rid of North Korean nuclear weapons and reunite with the South. Here's a here's a set of steps to to achieve it. Uh, I think that what we have to do is manage North Korea for a while to make sure that it uh, doesn't do harm to its neighbors, whether they be to the South, the West, the East, or across the Pacific ocean. And I think we need to, the one positive action I think we could take is, uh, is introducing more and more information into North Korea so that those who support the, the Kim dynasty eventually look at each other and say, why do we, why do we have this guy in charge? Uh, what's he done really for the country? Let's move him out. That's pretty much what happened in the Soviet Union. That's what happened in other authoritarian countries that have gotten rid of uh, that have gotten rid of uh, dictators like like that. And I think we sort of need we need to manage the defensive responsibilities of the countries around North Korea, including nuclear weapons. I mean, I, yes, North Korea has nuclear weapons, but they are an established government that is not suicidal. And and Kim knows, and we know that he knows that should he use a nuclear weapon against the Republic of Korea, where there are a large number of American forces, Japan, where there are also a large number of American forces, the, the United States would retaliate and would obliterate North Korea as we, as we know it. He's not suicidal, and I don't care if he has 12, 12 of these weapons, 20 of these weapons, 30 of these weapons, 50 of these 50 of these weapons, the United States has five or 6,000 of them, and there would be nothing left in North Korea should, uh, should he use it. So it's not a terribly useful uh, capability, and I think he can be, can be deterred. So I think he needs to be deterred, managed, more information pushed into his country. What we learn from all defectors from, from North Korea is that what finally clicked in their minds is that this propaganda this relentless barrage of propaganda that I've been receiving ever since I was born uh, is somehow wrong, and we are not we are not being told the truth by our own government. Eventually, that will kick in, but I don't see any short-term 
clever strategies, military, diplomatic, uh, economic, that we could use to achieve those, those, those twin goals, which I think we should leave as our goals, but I think we need to be realistic in terms of uh, how we go after them. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is often said, um, particularly now uh, in the media, that the Obama administration, despite the pivot to Asia, was quite weak on China, that it took the Trump administration to be really strong and forceful and tell the Chinese where the red, red lines are. Is there any validity, any truth in that, or what? how would you interpret uh, the history of the last two administrations towards China, and what is best? Right, well, I, I will give you the typical insider's answer, but I guess it's nonetheless, uh, nonetheless true. Uh, we, were, we were not as unpivoted from Asia uh, before the Obama administration announcement as, uh, as uh, was announced in the, in the newspapers. Uh, when I was the commander in chief, we made a number, of, a number of key military moves to increase our power in the Pacific. You see the, the two areas that attract American national security attention for at least the last 20 or 30 years have been the Middle East, uh, not only not only starting in, in, uh, nine, with 9-11, but even before that, the first Iraq war in 1991 and so on, and, and Asia. Those have been the two pulls on American national security uh, attention. It turns out that the, that the military component of, of, uh, to support our policy in the Middle East is primarily ground, ground force centered army marine corps a certain amount of air support from the from the um, navy and the uh, and the air force in the pacific the basic missions are almost entirely air and mar air and mar maritime that's a heavy uh, responsibility for the navy and the air force very little involvement by the army unless by the uh, unless by the and some by the marine corps so the united states in fact back in 2000 and all, was able to concentrate more of its Navy and Air Forces in the Pacific in view of the growing Chinese threat, uh, while not detracting from being able to uh, send forces to the Middle East, which were prim primarily Army and Marine Corps. And we did, in fact, uh, shift our power that way well before uh, the, announced, uh, the announced pivot. Uh, so, uh, and then what, and, and of course, uh, it's a common, uh, criticism of the Obama pivot. And I think it's a, it's a true one that even though in the military situation we were balanced pretty well, uh, when the pivot was uh, was announced, the parts of it that were publicized were the military components of it, which were relatively minor since most of the things had been actually actually done, and there was not that much of a uh, of a diplomatic uh, policy and economic. Uh, follow through as there could have been. Uh, the TPP was certainly a part of it, but that turned out not to be not to be successful. At that time, also, I think that um, <laughs> the United States in general, and this was not just the Obama administration, uh, had this idea that uh, China was some troublesome teenager uh, who was growing up and kind of gangly and uh, and and not doing all the right things. And if we just talk to them in the right way, explained what happens when you become the number two economy in the world, how you have to act responsibly and how, how you have to assume responsibility for common goods and so on, that China would, would realize and would, uh, and would sort of become first a junior United States and then a, and then a, and then a partner. Well, you know, that was pretty naive when you, uh, when you think about it. And uh, I think that naivete was, uh, was pretty much exploded in the latter years of the Obama administration when uh, all of these Xi Obama summits uh, really did not lead to long-term changes in Chinese, Chinese behavior. Uh, then in comes, in comes President Trump, a completely different, uh, different personality um, uh, with, all of the, uh, with all of the resentment against the damage that uh, done to the Chinese, uh, done to American industry by, by China. And so he, uh, he turned to his favorite uh, weapon, which were, which were tariffs, and uh, imposed this broad set of tariffs. Now, when the negotiations began over 
uh, removing these tariffs, the United States carried in the full set of individual uh, 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 problems that it had with Chinese behavior, intellectual property, theft, uh, illegal subsidies, environmental, environmental uh, mistakes, uh, over, overproduction in areas like steel and, and so on. And, and the United States tried to negotiate these individual functional economic issues uh, using tariffs as a uh, as, as the big hammer to enforce them, and that fell apart. So we're sort of in the let's drop back and see what uh, and see what we're going to do next time. My hope is that on both sides of the Pacific, uh, both in China and in the United States, there's careful thinking being done about uh, what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked, what the real objectives of each countries both are and that we can have a, a, a quiet and effective uh, dialogue before the, the whole thing becomes politicized and presidential and, and in which we have the breathless media asking who's winning, who's losing, who's, who's ahead. That's the only way I think we're really going to uh, make progress. Now the chances of that ha happening in the, uh, in the current hypercharged atmosphere are probably pretty small, but if, you were writing the, if I were writing the script, that's how I try to write it. Okay, thank you. Towards the end of our evening, let me ask you one final, maybe speculative question. We all, I think, are agreed that neither appeasement, nor open conflict, or even war are very productive at all. What will the situation look like, let's say, in 10 years' time? What would you expect to have happened where is some accommodation possible so that, as you said, uh, China and the United States may be partners on the world scene, perhaps with a strong India, hopefully, and a strong Europe uh, uh, thrown into it for good measure? Or will it be further rivalry, further escalation, further conflict, and really a divided world? What do you think in 10 years' time, with a bit of luck, what can we hope for? I think it really will depend on um, climate change and economic issues in the world. Uh, I think, I think militarily, the things that I described will <clears throat> will happen. Con China will continue to build up militarily. The United States and its allies and friends will continue to build up militarily. But it will be there will be a balance, but at a higher level of force on both sides. It won't change the fundamental, the fundamental uh, risk calculation for China and, and that military aggression in East Asia will be, uh, will be high risk and it won't, it won't happen. So that really, that really means what will happen, uh, what will happen economically. And, um, and then this uh, common threat that we face in terms of climate change, I think will have a greater and greater impact. I mean, I can see easily in 50 years that we look back and say, let's see, we were worried about what reefs in the South China Sea when all the reefs have been, you know, are now 12 feet under underwater. And, and, uh, and it just seems silly what we were fighting over back in, uh, or not fighting, but disputing over back in uh, 2019, uh, 2020 20, we have much bigger problems than than that so i i really think that the military situation will stay at a deadlock and it will then depend on uh it will then depend on how many common problems uh really force us to work together whatever we think of the other side's political system and i think it will depend on who's which country's economic model uh proves to be uh, the most successful, uh, bring the most prosperity to its people, handles the problems that, uh, that vex its people on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I, I'm not going to venture a prediction on, on that, but I think that's what we should be watching. Thank you very much indeed. I would like to thank my two assistants, uh, Brittany and Pete, for having asked our questions so uh, fruitfully and productively. 
so that we had a good Q&A session. I would also like to thank Paula Montagna, our IT expert, who has been quietly in the background, but observing everything and uh, being ready to jump in if there had been a technical problem, but luckily there wasn't. And of course, not least, and above all, I would like to thank, uh, to thank Admiral Dennis Blair for being here, for talking to us, for giving us your insights, and not least for answering our many questions so very well and in a very enlightening and interesting way. I think we all have profited from this evening. I would like to thank you and I would like to encourage you perhaps to come back in the future at some stage. That would be very nice indeed. I would also like to thank our regional, national and global audience for having uh, been with us for over two hours. That's pretty good of you. And I would like to mention that in uh, two weeks time on the 23rd of September, we will have another Krasno session. And this time we will talk about the global, uh, the global race for a vaccine to overcome the Corona virus crisis. So that is in, on the 23rd of September. I hope you will all be with us and come back. And for tonight, thank you again, Admiral Blair. For tonight, a good night to all of you. See you again on the 23rd of September. Good night.